Welcome to another episode of Polycast. Uh, I'm uh, Wouter Snijders, um, also known as Locutus on the forums. I'm here with uh, Dan, Dan Q. Quick. Hi, Wouter. Hi, Dan. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Imran and Maki could make it. I'm afraid they uh, said a few too many bad things about Dan, so we had to let them go. <laughs> uh, but we found someone else to take their place. <laughs> He's our uh, brand new off-topic moderator, um, known hey, as Droke on the forums. Oh. Hey, Droke. So, Will, is your last name pronounced Brambley? Is that right? Did I yep. get that right? Exactly. Brambley or Bramley, anything like that. We're never quite sure whether the B is silent in it or not. I do think we need to have mention of uh, colonization coverage. Yeah. I mean, that was announced uh, in early last October. Uh, it's nice to see that the threat has been uh, resurrected all of a sudden, although some people only just recently, such as Dis, realized that it was an old thread. But, you know, better late than never. Yeah, I, I have to say I didn't realize it was an old thread. So I just notice now. <laughs> <laughs> I can count on one hand the number of times I've played the game, and on two hands the number of hours I've played the game. Shame on you. <laughs> I was too busy playing the original Civ. Oh, yeah, actually, I, I'll agree with that as well. But then, initially, <laughs> I was playing Civ at when I was like, fine. Hmm. I don't even own a copy of Colonization. <gasps> oh, Dan, what are we going to do with you? So many have asked that question for so many years and come up with nothing. <laughs> 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 what hope do you have? <laughs> I love Dan's ironic voice. It's brilliant. <laughs> Yes, I am brilliant. You can stay. <laughs> <laughs> so, this week on the show, we have uh, a Q&A by uh, Sid Meier that was on GameSpot. Uh, we talk about uh, how Sid has been doing in the, in the game charts, about a, uh, very short about the Warlords demo game, about uh, the top 10 franchises in, in gaming history and about the award season that's coming up. In the Modcast, we're talking about AI difficulty, and we talk about if the four governments are communist. We have a uh, fact that uh, PostCon was restored, and we'll talk about all the new uh, staff members that have joined us in the past week or two weeks or so. In this week's Senate, we look at double-crossing and the rules of diplomacy in Civil War, whether you should be allowed to attack and do what you want with impunity, or whether there should be certain rules. Um, and we also look at whether you should ever start a war without catapults, i.e. before you have invented catapults. And finally, in our interview this week, we have Kurt Sibling, or the first part of it anyway. Sid Meier chronicles civilization. So I guess there's this uh, there's this line about with the exception of the semi sequel Civilization Call to Power and some ports, all Civilization titles have been developed under the direction of Sid. Um, I guess we're forgetting Call to Power two. I realize it didn't have Civilization in the title, but come on now, <sighs> Tor, what are you doing? Call to Power semi sequel bit though. So. We didn't start off very well. <laughs> For shame. <laughs> And thank you, Sid, for uh, now I can now source you for the adage, time flies when you're having fun. See, I've said that before, and people have said to me, who says that? And now I can say Sid does. Are, are these people who would know who Sid is, though? I really don't see how that's relevant. <laughs> <laughs> and I see the part about where uh, GameSpot asked him if he was concerned about older Civ titles would be received well, and Bond's about... Well, we won't have the visual wow factor, but they hold their own through gameplay. I would agree with that. Yeah, I'd go for that. Yeah. I mean, if people but buy Chronicles, presumably they'd like to have the whole spectrum. And if they haven't played one of the original games, one of the first few titles, then how are they going to know? They shouldn't complain until they've tried it. Don't knock it till you try it. The bit that got to me, though, is the complete non-mention of Alpha Centauri anywhere in that. 
but that's probably just because it's me. Yeah, it's not officially a Sith game, I guess. No, but it is. I suppose I always thought of it in the sequel, and as a Sith Meyer game as well. <coughs> Electronic Arts! <coughs> <coughs> oh, <coughs> that Let's BAFTA from a... From that BAFTA from before keeps <coughs> turning into something else. But, you know, for our sci-fi fans out there, like myself, are you a sci-fi fan? Well, of course you are. The answer is yes, by the way. Of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like with the original Civ titles, I kind of compare that to Toss, the original series of Star Trek. Its visual and special effects may not be as impressive as the series came after it, but it holds its own in storylines, just like Civ holds its own in terms of content and enjoyment. Possibly, though, I'd probably dispute that with Star Trek. Yeah. <laughs> I'm never a fan of the Not sure if you you like uh, tribbles and, uh, what is it, worlds that are run like mafia or all silly storylines like that. Yeah, I never even got that far to really notice them, <laughs> to be honest. And I just lost Murder and Will. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah, there's not... Like, it's an interesting... That interview, joke never gets old. I think it's an interesting interview, but all the sort of things he's saying are things we know before. It's quite cool. Yeah. Know, now it's one, but there's nothing really new to the Sith community there. That's the thing that stood out to me as well. There's nothing that we didn't know. Although I did like his uh, comment when being asked about uh, Civ titles being transferred to consoles and talks about the uh, Engage port on Civ 2. Did you see what Sid said about that? Burn. Praxis wasn't part of the development process, so it was ill-fated from the beginning. Wow. Hmm, I gloss over that, I think. Oh, yeah, I see it now. Also, I what this Soren Johnson's card game in his belt. Apparently, he's in for Civ that goes with Chronicles. Indeed, yes. I, uh, I own a copy of Chronicles, but I haven't had a chance to play it for a number of reasons. One, I really don't know anybody in real life that still plays Civ games, and even when they did, I think it was to humor me. But also, I'm not very good at card games. I've been pretty bad, except since Go Fish. I was pretty good at that. <laughs> oh, <dear. Okay. laughs> Poor Dan. Although I am mediocre to poor at Frank Zoo. I have to say, I have no idea what that is at all. <laughs> Neither oh. <have> I. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I'm kind of hoping they release this card game on its own, because I have all the suits, apart from Civ 3, which I keep being told not to buy. Um, so I really have no need to buy the whole Chronicle, yeah. especially not for a card game. Uh, I'd love to have the card game as well, but I doubt they'd be releasing, releasing it separately. Uh, I suppose, technically, Civ Chronicles could make a, a good present for someone who's not yet obsessed with Civ. Well, if they're not already obsessed with Civ, then who are they? Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> People in real life. <laughs> I was going to say people under 25, but uh, that's not entirely true, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anyone in real life who's under 25 and who plays safe. Really? No. Uh, strangely actually, enough, I suppose I, so. actually, thinking about it, neither do I. <laughs> That's, that's, well, quite, that's quite worrying. <laughs> neither do I, but... Oh, we've been through this already, that's right. Yes. <laughs> Oh, yes, yeah. talks about how the design process for uh, Civ 4 was a 180-degree turn from previous Civ titles where multiplayer was developed and focused on first before the single-player aspect, and it shows uh, to the betterment, I, I think. And uh, Sid also alludes to uh, the 3D graphics as uh, major changes. Now, I wouldn't categorize the following as, as a major change, but I think we've talked about this uh, previously, but I would put the incorporation of religion in Civ 4 as a significant and cultural borders in Civ 3 before that as a notable addition, regardless of what the general consensus on Civ 3 might be for some. And nobody disagrees with me, so they're saying nothing. <laughs> Hooray! What was I when reading this article? I don't remember any of this. <laughs> kind of thing as well. Um, Is there a page two? <laughs> Whereabouts is it? I can't see that at all. I'm thinking I must be going going blind here. Oh, I see something about 3D now. It's just below the pretty picture of uh, the Chronicle set. So I guess uh, we could summarize by saying, uh, unless there's something else, that everyone should read this article because GameSpot needs more traffic. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yeah.
They'll go under without your support. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> I I would agree with that too. So. <laughs> Civilization 4, 14th in October PC game sales in North America. Wow. What? Mm -hmm. quite funny about this. <laughs> Number 13 is Desperate Housewives. You know... It is? I, I, it is, yes. <laughs> I think it's all in all a decent list of titles, except that one. Like, well, I don't know. The Sims 2 Fat stops the list? Well, you know, they're just milking <laughs> that franchise for all it's worth. At number six, we have The Sims 2 Glamour Life Stuff. Uh, number 9, Just The Sims 2. Yeah. And um, number 20, Sims 2 Nightlife. I don't know. Uh, I, I guess so. The list is The Sims and Company, I guess. That's how we do Yeah, think. pretty much. <laughs> well, at least it is the Australian uh, uh, hot selling list. The last time I checked that, there were nine sim games in the two top ten. Why? Why? I don't get yeah. that. <laughs> Something seriously wrong with Aussies. Go back to Sim City, please. Please. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But what I find even more interesting than Civ 4 still being, you know, 14th to the 20th, you know, more than a year after its release, that's great, but Warlords is not on there. And released just this past July. So maybe it will be on the list in November or December as, you know, those sales charts comes out. You know, not people. Not really. What it people was on 18th place last month, or in September actually, because it's the October list. And it was, I think, 14th or 12th in August. So it's long since disappeared from the listing. It's possible to come back. True. There could be a couple of... <laughs> I can imagine most people have either just brought Civ and aren't really ready to add it onto Warlords yet because they're still getting used to it, or it's sold yeah. as a pack, and so um, it's just counted as Civ 4. The people who are interested in Warlords have already bought it. I think if you're interested in Warlords at all, you're going to buy it when it's new. Well, Probably. People well, people who seem to be discovering Civ 4 for the first time, perhaps, if Civ 4 is still 14th out of 20th position, more than a year later. Or yeah, uh, sure, but, I mean, if uh, an expansion pack is going to sell maybe 20% of the original game, so if Civ 4 is only in 14th place, I don't want to know how far uh, Warlords has sunk. Mm. What strikes me, though, is, I don't know if it's the same on your webpage, but online there's a big advert for Civ 4 Warlords right next to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, there isn't for, my, for me because I use Adblock, but... <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that anybody... There might be some people also rediscovering the series after hiatus or a total newcomer. I think any number of fanboys or girls of the series who have yet to pick up uh, a copy are more likely uh, than not insignificant. But, you know, Chronicles is not on this list, but it wasn't released yet. And, you know, we've got a couple months lag time here, so if... Chronicle sales are high, and people are going through the list, and people are pointing out it's all Civ titles except if they like what they see, they play Civ 4, they might go, hmm, I should get that. And also, it's holiday season, which is the time of giving. You never it's know. It is the time of Medieval 2, to the War, of War, World of Warcraft, Warhammer 4000. I don't think uh, Chronicles is going to be able to compete with those. Mm. Remember, it's a top That's ten. Only the very best gets in there, in terms of sales numbers. Huh? I was about to say, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, there's five sim games in there, so. Yeah, I think it's also the the price, and um, it's such a often so much in price yeah. that at that price is that are there going to be many people buying it for presents? Only if you love them. <laughs> that's, the message, that's the message of this podcast. If you love them, you'll buy them Chronicles. <laughs> yeah. And you'll buy it through a pulp. <coughs> oh, where'd that come from? <laughs> hey, you shouldn't be coughing over that. I was trying to look impartial. Mm -hmm. Yep. I don't think anyone's going to be fooled. No, no, neither do I. I was convinced. Oh, wait. <laughs> Put on your Warlords demo game in the making. I really don't have any notes on that, but I thought it was worthwhile to note that it is up and running, or trying to get up and running. If you're interested, go check it out. Yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say about it. Sounds good. Probably helps if you have Warlords. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Civ 
Civilization IV tenth top video game franchise. <sighs> Breathe, Dan. Breathe. Th- this struck me as slightly strange again. But you look at some of the ones above them that I've never heard, and which sounds quite strange to me as someone who tends to play quite a lot of games. And uh, and yet, sort of, there's no quake. There's no. Just strikes as a bit of a strange list, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, you know, Civ is 10th on this list. I mean, 10, you know, if 2 to 5 is an insult, which it is, anything less than a 5 is an outrage. I mean, I appreciate that IGN noted the criteria for in, uh, deciding this list. Let's see. Consider the overall importance of the franchise. Well, <laughs> I think it's pretty easy to argue that Civ, if not founded, then at least revolutionized the God Game series. So that's taken care of. Uh, the strength of its library of titles and the excitement for future games in the series. Well, is there an end to Civ? No. Right? Yep, I think you're exactly right on that. I, mean, I can understand the top few. There are some good competitors, Mario, Zelda, Final Fantasy. But Civ definitely should be right up there. And to make matters worse, uh, kind of tying into a previous news item, you know, even if you had to put Sim higher on the list, and Civ. Sin City should be a category unto itself, please. And if you're going to at least talk about the Sim, why is the whole blurb about the Sims? It's like Sim, 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 notable titles, Sim, 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 Sim City. What? Just kind of like tacked on at the end there. Well, that's Sim Earth. They clearly mean the whole Sim <laughs> series. But... <laughs> Sim Earth. <laughs> I'm not sure why they put that on there, but... Well, there was also Sim Farm, which is better than Sim Earth, not that that would be hard, but, uh... <laughs> I think, that, yeah, there are quite a few, actually, that, that strike me as a bit out of place. I mean, Dungeons & Dragons at 14, I would have thought that would have been a bit more, a bit more of a top franchise. And uh, Sonic, a good 18 places behind Mario. Some people will never learn. I actually thought it was surprising how uh, low Command & Conquer was on the list. I mean, it was only 21. True, true. So, how, how, was it, yeah, well. how was it, again, you said they managed to decide this? Uh, considering the overall importance of the franchise, the strength of its library of titles, and the excitement for future games in the series. Now, I'm not sure if they're giving equal weighting to all of those, or if they've actually listed them in order for a reason they don't say. But I suppose with the second one, the strength of its library of titles, if we had to choose in the Civ franchise which was the least strong, no, I wouldn't say weakest here at all, but I suppose you could say Civ 3. But <laughs> I wouldn't say weakest, for it's perhaps only in comparison to other Civ titles that Civ 3 you could say is weaker. I mean, the series isn't over yet, so you're not going to say weakest. But on its own, it's still a strong title, so I don't really know what these people were thinking, other than the fact that they love video game franchises and not computer game franchises, and that is terrible. You should be ashamed of it. Let's just get one thing clear here. Civ 3 sucked. <laughs> Send all hate mail. <laughs> I, I have to stand oh, out, of, out of this discussion. <laughs> I have to remain out of this discussion, having never played it. How convenient well, for you. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Consider yourselves very, very lucky. Oh, I'm just still shocked about Quake not being on that list at all. I oh, I'm, I'm going through the list now. I hadn't actually done that before, but how many games are there on here that are PC only? I think Sif is just about the only one. Uh, Half-Life? The, the list is very... Ah, Half-Life. But it's very much uh, biased against uh, console games, I get the idea. Mm. I mean, higher higher on Which, the list other than Civ is a number of titles that just... Uh, I don't know. Well, yeah, I don't know. It's a pretty good list for the most part. Yeah, I mean, it's a bit silly to, to uh, throw the whole Sim series together with The Sims and all the other Sim games. Uh, but that's a good series. Um, mm. Metroid is well, that's a pretty good series. Resident Evil. You can't argue with Warcraft. No, but Mario Res- and Zelda. Yeah, Resident Evil, that's just disturbing, though. I should be on there. Be gone! Mm. <laughs> I should possibly be a little low- lower down. Castlevania? Yeah, What's this Castlevania? But, yeah, that's the only one I haven't heard of. Yeah. What a joke. Actually, I, <laughs> I haven't heard of that at all either. What's it even on? Really old game, I see a big leap in 32-bit. That's a while ago. <laughs> yeah, um, I have no idea. But yeah, but as I said, it's it's very biased against console games, and well, I haven't really played many consoles. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> that put me back in favor with Dan. <laughs> yes, you can stay too. <laughs>
I combined uh, GameSpy's Gamer Choice Awards and Voodoo Extreme's 2006 Best Expansion together, seeing as how their uh, Gamer's Choice Awards bit of a popularity contest, ultimately. Okay, sure. I see along with uh, Galactic Civilizations 2 Dreadlords and the Civ 4 Expansion Warlords, other notable titles uh, in the strategy category include Civ City Rome, Caesar 4, and my favorite title by name, Def Con Everybody Dies. <laughs> That's brilliant. Is it? <laughs> it is the coolest title ever. That is true. <laughs> I feel so positive when I say that. <laughs> it's all in how you say it, right? <laughs> Everybody I dies. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to get that game just to see what it is. <laughs> I don't want to spoil the ending, but... um. <laughs> <laughs> You know, this is the first time I've ever seen a strategy game classification of words or otherwise broken up between RTS and non-RTS. I, I can actually see that happening. I think RTS is becoming more of a, um, almost a bit more action-focused and a bit more, not really a pure strategy game, because it's not about sitting there thinking, it's about actions moving quickly, doing things uh, in certain times. So I, I, can, I can see the logic in splitting the two of them up. They appeal to different types of people. Well, they are, that is very logic, but um, yeah, usually they are lumped together because TBS is just such a small market. I can remember actually a, a long time ago, 10 years ago, it was quite normal to separate the two. But uh, well, as the TBS market got smaller, they just got thrown together more and more often. Yeah, so now the so, TS yeah. is uh, what split between city builders, turn-based games, hybrids, and a few strategy games we don't even know how to categorize. Well, if you don't know how to categorize them, how can we possibly learn? <laughs> but given that, why is Rise of Nations, Rise of Legends in uh, this category along with Warlords and Gal Civ 2? Rise of Nations, Rise of Legends is not. That's City true. Builder, turn-based hybrid, it's on RTS. Why isn't it in the RTS category? That's entirely true, but the same could be said for Medieval 2 Global War. And then they've also got uh, 1701 AD. It's also a real-time strategy game. What? Why isn't it in the RTS category? Hello? <laughs> this strike me slightly strange. Calling all editors. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Okay. Too much to say about that, other than the people really need to go and start voting for it. And uh, with the, uh, the overall choice, if this is indeed gamers' choice voting, um, should not all of the titles listed for individual category awards be up? for overall as well. I mean, GameSpy's list includes some expansions in the overall rating, uh, such as uh, the second Warhammer 40,000 Dawn of War add-on Dark Crusade and the sixth, wow, EverQuest 2 expansion. Echoes of Freighter, or however that's pronounced. I don't play EverQuest, so I don't care. So what's going on? Uh, where's Warlords? Probably because some games don't have any chance of winning anyway. Yep, I don't know. <laughs> Probably seems <laughs> quite true. <laughs> but Defcon's still there. Well, that's good. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I'm actually voting for that one. <laughs> Warlords is, well, it's pretty solid, but it's not that brilliant. So for me, it's either Galactic Civilizations 2 or Defcon on base of name only. <laughs> <laughs> yes, with that name, nobody is cool enough to play that game with a title like that. That's true. And then with uh, Voodoo Extreme's 2006 Best Expansion, um, we've got about 2,500 ballots cast so far, and Civ for Warlords is, um, what's a nice word, trailing? With uh, about 220 or so, 230, or just over 9% of the vote. Although it's in good company, it's not that all the other titles are, you know, 15, 20%, and Civ's kind of down there with just 9 does anybody notice how this list of expansions starts off alphabetically but trails off? I can't say that I have. Well, there's a surprise, Mr. Observant. Not the sort of thing I really pay attention to, then. Well, it's either sloppy organization or something deliberate, because all of a sudden, Civ Four Warlords is at the bottom, but... Uh, well, I guess they made it Warlords the keyword here. Well, yes, this is, so it's listed after Warhammer 40,000, Dawn of War, Dark Crusade. But why isn't Warlords after Black and White 2, Battle of the Gods? Because it's the parent title 
that seems to take priority with some other titles, except once we get to Warlords, it's at the bottom of the list. For shame. I should hand out for shame awards. I, I think they're just considering it Warlords. I think it's quite justifiable as well, no, perhaps not. I think this is quite a non-issue. Yes. I think <laughs> Who the hell gives it that? I was trying to find something to say about this stupid poll. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think with the news, we can just quite simply say, this is the news, and it's, uh, there's just not that much to talk about this week. <laughs> Yeah. Well, actually, looking at the poll results, the Warlords is third. You could say that's trailing by a long way, but if you look at most of the other games, they got less than 30 votes. Hmm. And Warlords got 300. It's actually pretty good. If you have any news for us, any news tips, contact us with news yes. tips. Head on over to apolton.net slash about, look for contact us, or um, news at apolton.net also works. And you can also PM. Yes, you can. Locutus, Dan Q, Snoopy369, and Illuminatus. One of us four will we'll get that up there. In the Modcast, uh, we talk about hot issues that have happened in the forums. Well, this actually really related to a question that I had, which was um, in Civ 4, um, and actually in most of the scenes, uh, when you go to part of difficulty levels, all it does is give the AI um, bonuses. It makes them play under rules that the humans don't. And there seems to be a really good discussion on how could you make the AI a better player rather than giving them bonuses so they can play under the same rules, but it can actually be a decent match. Mm, make them human. Oh, wait, we haven't reached that level of technology yet. Uh, I'm out of ideas. <laughs> yes, we do. It's called multiplayer. True, true. The, the multiplayer is a lot more of a hassle to try and play when you just want to go and have a quick game. That's definitely true. Actually, I think Blake needs some um, congratulations for all the work he's done. It does seem that he's got some quite amazing stuff he's managed to do to the AI to make it play towards that level. Yes, it's very impressive. I can't say I've tried it very extensively, but uh, it does look good, and people are very happy with it. People are better at uh, this game than me, so... Mm-hmm. Yeah. I still feel like such a newbie to uh, Civ 4. That's okay. You can join my club. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I suppose with all, the, with all the poly stuff, you probably don't have much time to actually play it anymore. It's been that way for... Mm, ten years? <laughs> <laughs> And so I guess our CIF for government's communist. Well, um, <laughs> this discussion starts off as a Sava rant. <laughs> I think that's safe to say. <laughs> About the government building everything from city buildings to wonders, and that the civics label merely hides the reality that what is in place are totalitarian regimes. Perhaps most literally, in a sense, this is true and always has been, as Lord Avalon notes, it's all done by the player as God. Or, as Aaron adds, Civ is central planning to the nth degree. So I'm not really sure there's a problem here. No, true. I, I think it's quite an, an interesting way to look at it, um, with the government building everything. But I'm sure there are other ways you could sort of look at it in the sense of it's about the government enabling other people. Sort of, they, they add the resources and they decide or aid what needs to be built, and then other people actually go and pay for it and build it. I think there's many ways to look at it. Yeah, I just I just wonder if uh, getting into that might take away from the fun factor, or at least try to find a way to implement that so that the learning curve is, is not too high and the replayability interest is, oh. is still there. What I was more meaning was I, I think you could look at actually how it is at the moment and argue that it already does that. I don't think what, while you decide what to build, that necessarily everything is built by the government and that nothing else happens. But, yeah, I think it is one of those... Playable things. I like uh, Blake's uh, name, the Playerian play Regime. Minus that uh, Iron Fist part, uh, perhaps arguably in earlier Civ titles, but I'm not so sure that I Iron Fist exactly. But the comment about an immortal player who may be good or evil or chaotic, neutral, or pretty much anything. I think or pretty much anything is uh, a nice catch-all phrase. Mm. Yeah. yeah, that's true. I mean, Dr. Spike notes the, the Senate from Civ 2. Remember, you're under democracy and you try to go with someone and cross your fingers that the Hawk Party will intervene? 
I remember those days. I have to say I don't. That's before my time. <laughs> hmm. I'm trying to forget them. <laughs> Were they really that bad? No. No, they just remind us how old we are. <laughs> <laughs> Do a convincing elf impression. That would have been the time. Uh-huh. Exactly. That was remarkably good. I'm impressed. I'm slightly scared. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, Wouter founded that club. I'm scared of Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Card carrying member. Anyway. So are we settled then? Civil governments are communist, but it really doesn't matter. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Oh. <laughs> 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 uh, and so I guess we move on from our gaming modcast topics to community. The OG yeah. post started with post counts restarted. Yes, and the thread that announced it got deleted. <laughs> <laughs> that is a highlight of the year. <laughs> I know. Actually, I haven't noticed an influx of spam yet, except um, one thing we're all looking at is: does, did it actually stop? Any of this plus one ing on the um, community forum, or does that still go ahead as normal? I think it's less. I think it's less. Yes, I would agree. It's not gone, but it's uh, nowhere near what it used to be. So it seems all around to be a good move, then. Yep. Well, actually, done, guys. Actually, I was going to ask about this, because some um, some people have been uh, made comments about this sort of being the brought in of, of the new, sort of the, the, the new live rulers and the new order and things that sort of things will start changing about that. Um, what do you two guys kind of think of that? Are you... Is this the start of a lot of big changes on Polly, or...? Mm. <laughs> what shall we say? Uh, upon the secret conspiracy. How about, how about yeah. maybe or maybe not? Sounds like a damn comment no. to me. Well, I was going to say no comment, but that would be <laughs> rude. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I think it's fair to say that a lot of things will change over time. But uh, it will take some time to uh, do everything we want Ooh. to do. So initially it will be relatively small things, like increasing postcards again, although I think for some people that will be a big thing. Uh, but I think after a few months, maybe in, in January, February, we'll start to see the first uh, really big changes. And, uh, well, that's going to continue for a while, but we don't want to say exactly how and what. I, sh- I shall look forward to that then. Be sure to visit every day, multiple Thank times a day. Better. <laughs> <laughs> You don't want yeah, to be the last one on the street knowing what's going on, because that would be embarrassing. It certainly would be. <laughs> New off-topic moderator. Wait again, didn't we talk about this earlier? What, what did you say off-topic was again? I, oh. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, anyway. just, just that bit of the site that kind of keeps it running and keeps everyone involved. Oh, what would you know about it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm in dire danger of finding Dan funny by the end of this. It's funny. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know you have to quit. <laughs> and you start examining how many hours have I been awake? <laughs> <laughs> so I guess uh, you formally joined the Apolton community in October 2002 based on your forum profile. Were yeah. you, uh, did you visit Apolton before then? Uh, kind of, only very briefly. I um, I was just end up getting back into Alpha Centauri and did a bit of googling for it, and suddenly stumbled upon the democracy game and thought that was an amazingly wonderful idea. So that became my uh, yeah, that and um, my actual like university or stuff became my my life for a good few few months. Yeah, kind of how I found it before. But no, it was really really good actually. I have still have good memories of the first democracy game. Not that you'll have time for those anymore, but. Uh... <laughs> well, well, we can see. I always used to argue that that democracy game was what got me into Oxford in the first place, because it ended up getting quite heated discussions on um, political and economic issues, and my my Oxford interview tent was on one of the same discussions I just had on Polly the week before. So when you write papers, do you cite Paul? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. You no. don't? <laughs> no, of no, that, that's going a bit too far, I think. Yeah. It's nice that it got you into Oxford. You don't want to have to kick you out of Oxford. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, just, I, I do kind of wonder what's happening to a lot of people who were there at the time, because a guy called Archaic, who is an utter, utter genius, just rather unsociable as well, dear me. It's quite funny. 
non-tarot. I'm just more a bit worried actually at the moment about what the, uh, the guys are deciding to choose as my new title and tagline. <laughs> Letting the forum decide on themselves didn't, didn't seem like the best idea at the yeah. moment. But we'll see. Why do you think we chose this is not a democracy as our tagline? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we need sometimes to you guys have to learn the hard way, you newbies. Uh, I'm sure I will do. Though I am quite shocked at the response so far, actually, at how positive everyone's been. Yes. Yeah, that's true. But then again, we've I, covered that. It's because you don't do anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, come on. I, I, I've been a mod for how long? Like two days? Yeah, you're old school now. <laughs> Yesterday's news. We have, new, we have other staff members that got appointed as well. Not just you. It's yep. all about you. It's true. It is true. Yeah. You do have the good fortune that you're not uh, the youngest one on the crew, at least in terms of uh, staff seniority. Mm. True, true. Two people that are even younger. Who has actually been announced as some you know, the Cold Power mods? Uh, there are two Cold Power mothers. <laughs> and they've been doing, uh, well, especially E has been doing a lot of good, jo- good work on the, uh, uh, the source code project. And uh, Bureau Bird has his own website with some really good modding info on there. And, uh, well, I don't have time to maintain the cold power sections anymore. So uh, we ask those guys to uh, step up and take over my job, basically. Okay. My old job. And it takes two of them to do your old job. Wow. Yep. That's how good Heroes. it is. You're a hero. <laughs> yes, I am. <laughs> Not going to deny that. <laughs> and, of course, we've got... Um, is it Diadem or Diadem to announce? I think it's Diadem. Yeah, not sure about that one. Yeah, he seems to it's seems to fit. Another new guy in this. Seems to hit the ground running as well. Awful lot of stuff he's done so far. Yes, yeah. he only had uh, PCR or po- uh, post count reduction and banning capabilities on our forms for a few moments, so he could um, investigate Lord Shiva's account. Do, 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 what happened with Lord Shiva's account? Nothing <laughs> <laughs> that he knows of. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay. And uh, he uh, actually, uh, it seems he didn't know at first what that acronym was, uh, and then we got this polymercy chain reactions, and I thought we have just made up a new word, but it actually is a word. Did you know that? No, I didn't. I looked it up. Hooray for me, gold star! It is an enzyme that catalyzes the formation of new DNA and RNA from an existing strand of DNA or RNA. Um, that's the only definition I could find that was neither too long or I understood some of it. For example, I understood an, that, formation. <laughs> I understood those words. Yep, uh, it seems you understood the gist of it then, I think. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Finally, here, uh, as a community service, for those who have not uh, read this thread yet, I'm going to issue a level one IA or innuendo alert for the first page. Uh, may not be entirely family friendly. Which? First page. Uh, the first page of uh, the DM's appointment. Uh, something about uh, rods. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm. I, I was worrying for a second I hadn't got any render. Yeah. That would be against, <laughs> against precedent. Welcome to the Senate. In this section, we talk about game strategy. But uh, it, it's always annoyed me when I've been playing support. That I tend to be slightly evil when I'm playing Sith. And I quite like the idea of having this nice agreement with someone, you're going all fine, you're attacking a common enemy, and then suddenly they find a big set of catapults sitting outside their city. It's quite a good feeling. And uh, obviously Civ 4 stops you doing that, because you can't just have that sitting next to them and then declare war. And so it's always been one of those things that I thought, I can understand why they've done it for gameplay reasons, so I personally tend to think it's not, but almost from the realism aspect as well, that the fact that it doesn't let you cancel agreements, it uh, enforces certain things. Um, the most annoying one to me being the vassal states. You can't, can't, you can't decide to go and attack one of your vassal states, even if they start being annoying and sort of taking your culture board and that sort of thing. Any thoughts? From a gameplay uh, point of view, it's just, that's the way you have to do it if you want to have a remotely competitive AI. Mm, true with the AI, but then I was thinking when it's coming to even things like multiplayer and, and, and that sort of thing, is, it, is, this, is this sort of right that we're, or is it good for gameplay that we are stopped from doing certain actions? For instance, should it be that certain agreements are enforced and you can't just break them because sort of for real party reasons you're more powerful than you've got none? 
Yeah, like I said, I think for AI it's necessary. In multiplayer, I guess you could disable those rules. Can you? Is that feasible, or is that have to be uh, more to do it? Yeah, of course, but you would have to mod it. Um, I guess you know, if you could implement it, it could be fun to play with. Maybe I don't know what the consequences would be because I'm not really a hardcore multiplayer. I'm actually not a multiplayer at all. Uh, same here. I saw uh, Didim's suggestion of uh, mutual wars where one side won't withdraw from the conflict with the other side, also signing into peace. But I think that's worth considering. But I like uh, Sand Monkey's idea where you could have a uh, three-way bargaining session in diplomacy because, you know, far too often your neighbor makes peace and you're stuck in a war with the other guy who refuses to speak to you, yep. even if you were brought into that war by that neighbor who has now made peace. Yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah. I think, for me, diplomacy is possibly the weakest part of Civ 4. It's the one thing that I keep thinking little changes could make a really big impact on how the game is played. Obviously, I think with, with an AI, it's, it's always hard to work out what you can have and what you can't have. Yeah, I think that's, that's the biggest drawback here, and, uh, the biggest limitation, the AI. It's really hard to work around that. I like Sand Monkey's uh, in-game solution, where if when your friend and the enemy make peace, the enemy automatically offers you a ceasefire, not a peace treaty, but just a ceasefire that you can choose to accept or reject. And I think as we were getting at, we can always have more diplomacy options. True, definitely. Yeah, I agree there. That's been on, on fan uh, like request list for a long time, better diplomacy. And I do think that's one area where they could improve in the future. So, yeah, given the current circumstance, I never agree to request from an AI SIF to join a war regardless of my relationship either with the person asking for the war or with the people that I'm being asked to go into war against. I either say no because I really don't have an interest, either in a mindset, uh, as I'm, I'm often a builder. Imran and I are builders, as we discussed in the previous episode, or <laughs> sometimes, I mean, what's the point of going into war if you're not ready for it, uh, particularly on defense? Yeah, it's, I think it's an interesting issue to look at. I think it's definitely something in playtesting that uh, they need to look at the next time they bring out Sith 5. Yeah, that's true. Attacking a city without catapults. Always a city, right? Well, un- unless you have tanks. <laughs> well, oh, okay, then. <laughs> yeah, so for those who aren't aware, what in the heck are we talking about? Adrian Hunt describes a situation where he finds himself at war with a neighbor. Uh, sounds like he started the war, but I'm uh, not sure. And they're down to their capital. The enemy's down to their capital, but they've built up uh, their defenses. And Adrian's a good 15 to 20 turns away from, well, I believe he's getting at building their first catapult, although maybe he hasn't researched construction yet to build a catapult. I'm not sure. But I would refer to the suggestions provided by Ra uh, about parking on any critical resource and see if that baits a few units out of the city. And if he strips it down to uh, archers, for example, because those were uh, some of the units that were mentioned in the stack, then uh, bring in your swordsmen to uh, take them out. Yeah, I think Ra's got exactly the right tactic. It's more, I think, that the general question of, is it foolish early on in the game to launch a war before you have that? I mean, it, 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 while it's possible to take really badly defended cities, also one needs a few archers in their city, and the city being in a good area, and you pretty much... It's... Impervious to most. Yeah, I guess it depends what you want from the war. If you want to completely destroy an enemy, hmm, then it's going to be uh, quite questionable if you can do that without catapults and losing a whole lot of units. Uh, but if you just want to take one or two crucial cities, or just uh, hurt them just bad enough, you could take a few cities and then, then kind of fall behind in the long run. And uh, well, you could take the rest later when you do have catapults. Yeah, but with the larger cities, they've got too large a stack to take. You could uh, target those that have some uh, strategic resources and pillage, and then get the heck out of there. True. I suppose yep, there, are, there are a lot of options. Yeah. Well, there's also the suggestion about attack as many cities as possible in the first few turns of the war to avoid that buildup. If you can afford that, to launch that kind of many-pronged attack, then by all means. Awesome. So I guess what we're getting down to is it's, it's not foolish necessarily, but as long as you have a strategy... Do we know what those are? I think so. (laughs) Strategy in a strategy game? What? Hmm? Apparently. (laughs) What are you on about? I I think you've got it right there, though. It's it's as long as as you you can accept the fact that there's certain cities you're not able to take, or that you're going to lose an awful, awful lot of swords and axes, then 
You just have to wait until the castle falls. Yep. Yes. We're here with this week's interview. Uh, I'm here with Dan. Hello. And this week we're interviewing someone from the Sift 2 scenario community, Kurt Sibling. Hi, Kurt. Hi there. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Who, who are you in real life? Um, where are you from? What do you do? Well, I basically live in Glasgow, Scotland, and uh, I work as a tutor in Paisley University teaching 3D animation. But that is just my part-time job, full-time job, Civ 2, of course, <laughs> which I basically spend a lot of my time modding. But basically, yeah, I'm usually never more than nine meters away from my, some sort of computer. So, yeah, I'd say probably full-time geek is my occupation. <laughs> well, aren't we all? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> let's all join a club. Let's start a website. <laughs> <laughs> I think we did. <laughs> Uh, you've been a key member of the Civ 2 scenario making community for quite some time now. How did you get involved into both Civ and scenario making? Basically, I started off playing Civ 2 around about, more or less, when it came out. I, I played Civ 1, and obviously, when the second one came out, well, everyone else had bought it. But around that time, I only had a 56k connection, so obviously, getting onto sites was not easy. But it was really Polly and Civ. Uh, fanatics were the first kind of reached out and started uh, downloading a lot of the old scenarios at the time. But really, like a lot of other people, I just started making scenarios for myself, just tweaking the game engine a little bit just to see what you could change. But normally, what happened, I was quite, uh, I wasn't very ambitious to start with, but it was only when I started getting a better type of internet, like broadband, I took the jump and put something up online. It's kind of hard to remember the actual dates and details now. But I do remember the big impact of stuff like Nemo's 2194 Days of War and Second Front. That's when I really started getting involved because that was a big jump for Civ 2 graphics and gameplay you know, for scenarios. But yeah, that is as much I can remember because years go on, the, the memory starts to go. <laughs> 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 what was that again? Oh. Oh uh, yeah, well, I'll just make a comment about oncoming senility from my <laughs> Excellent, and ev even your most basic scenario is above and beyond mine. I actually do have a Civ 2 scenario, but I don't talk about it. Oh yeah. That's for good reason, though. <laughs> Everybody seems to have one tucked away. There's one person who, I would, he does scenarios, but he never releases as a fair line. Uh, he's another... A uh, very good creator, one of the best graphic makers around just now. Uh, but he keeps saying he has got scenarios tucked away, and he never, never shows them. And I always think I'd love to see these, these secret scenarios. But I would say the very first scenario I can remember making, uh, one called Global Power, and it, it was really strange. I, I basically, it was a bit like Civ 2 Vanilla, only started in 1950 and went on to a kind of crazy Star Wars kind of world where there was huge spaceships and kind of Gundam type robots walking about. And and I think that was about the first real scenario I made. I think that was 1998. I think quite a long time actually. Now I think about it, but I, I look. I sometimes look at it and I think, my God, that's so bad. <laughs> 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 Uh, you've designed a lot of scenarios over the years. What's your favorite one? Oh, well, I do have a great love for fantasy. I'm a Lord of the Rings fan to a certain degree, but I do love scenarios where you can break the rules of... I love history and I love World War II scenarios, but I do like scenarios where you're the boss and you come up with your own world, your own races. So I'd say probably the, the Bitter Frost uh, scenarios I, I made, they're probably my favorites, I think, because... I can go anywhere with them. I don't have to worry if I've got a city in every place or if uh, Japan did invade the Dutch East Indies at a certain month. I don't have to worry about those kind of details because you might write your own story. I'd say my overall favourite is probably one called Kingdoms of Steel. It's basically a fantasy mod made of just vanilla Civ 2 and it's quite funny. It kind of adds this sort of 15th century Europe kind of world that goes from that era up to this kind of magical world that's quite strange. The technology is very much based on pure fantasy material, but it's, it's fun to play. So uh, not don't have to worry about ICBMs or anything. It's just good fun. 
Uh, that's only on eight multiplayer gold. I'm thinking of making a version of it for some test of time, though, at some point, probably next year. Mm. Okay, and what's the one you're least happy with? Oof. I would say my least favourite probably is the one that gave me the most trouble. There was a version of Dictator, I think it was Dictator 2, the first one I'd done on test of time, and it wasn't because there was anything wrong with it, it's just at that point I was very unused to test of times. Kind of, it's slightly different from multiplayer gold, it's got a lot more rules, kind of, a lot of more added to the rules, and I made a lot of mistakes, but I didn't uh, make a technology tree properly, and a lot of things went wrong, and I just I ended up really just angry with the whole thing, and I said, ah, screw this, this is getting too hard to deal with, but I eventually did kind of win out, but I'm sure there's bugs still in it, but obviously it's all part of the learning curve, but I would say that one gave me the most trouble, it's one of my least, my least fun experience with Civ 2 was that scenario. So you've been, we've been touching upon a, a number of themes of your scenarios now, fantasy and, and World War II. Within those themes or any other themes, how do you choose a topic for a scenario? Where do you start? Ah, oh, it's not easy to decide. With the fantasy scenarios, I usually have a story dreamed up beforehand. Not fully fleshed out, but I usually know where I want it to go. It's usually a kind of loose theme. World War II, you're, you're more constrained with history. But I would say the story for World War II, I usually try and keep it within a certain, a certain theme. I, I usually like to start off in the Battle of Britain in World War II because it's one of, there's about three or four pivotal moments of World War II you can start out in. Battle of Britain, Stalingrad, or the launching of Invasion of Russia, all these kind of things. I'm sure there's parts of World War II genre that has not been covered yet. I mean, people have been saying to me, why don't you do a fantasy World War II where Bit of Frost meets World War Two, and I thought, how the hell would I pull that off? Uh, mm-hmm. But I don't know how I would work that one out. I'd maybe have a scenario where a lot of World War Two soldiers end up in a fantasy world. I think what I really want to do next is have a sci-fi purely and go into space. Maybe Star Wars, maybe Daleks in space, I'm not sure. But I would like to do a kind of fleet combat scenario at some point. The idea of big spaceships crashing in space is pretty cool. If, if I could get a good map. I think that's what I might be looking at this year. That sounds interesting. Mm-hmm. Do do uh, Star Trek or Babylon 5 or, or Doctor Who? Star Wars? Uh, nah. <laughs> <laughs> Find them all, put them all into the one scenario. That'd be great. Battlestar Galactica versus everyone else. That would be something. <laughs> that would be quite hard to work out. <laughs> I remember a creator called Kobayashi, or Kobe. He was very much into all the sci-fi engineers, and he'd done a Star Wars versus Star Trek scenario. I think it was heavily in favour of Star Wars over the looks of the events, but it was very interesting. It would cause a riot in a lot of fan websites, so I think, Star Trek could never beat Star Wars, never, <laughs> or vice versa. <laughs> but it was very well done. Mm, this interview was close to being over until you said... <laughs> 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 Wait, where are you guys going? Hey. <laughs> I'm, I'm completely neutral. I, I like, I love old sci-fi. It's all got good merits. That's my official stance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you've done quite a few uh, fantasy scenarios over the years. Um, where do you get the inspiration for those things? Well, I do a lot of cartooning as well. Uh, I've, I'm very much into uh, 2D artwork, and I've basically created a few comics in the time. I've been involved in cartooning since 1990. One of my projects is a fantasy a graphic novel I've been working on. It's like an intellectual property based in a certain world, and I do a mortless plunder rat for ideas a lot. A bit of Frost is based on a sort of derivative of rats, kind of frosty cold world with all these harsh humans versus all these other harsh dudes, and the big lingering threat in the north, the big bad guys that invade. That's a theme of the scenario on Civ 2, and it's a theme of the comic as well. But fantasy is as endless as your own imagination. Even if I didn't use the bit of Frost idea, there's other crazy ideas that it's really look outside your window, and there's sure to be somebody strange that you can base a scenario on. I, I, I get the train through Glasgow every morning, and there's plenty of fantasy creatures on the train that you can uh, base your ideas on, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> One walk through Glasgow, and you'll see plenty of fantastic uh, things. <laughs> It's cold and frosty here as well, so maybe that is a, a subliminal sort of inspiration I've got, I'm not sure. But yeah, uh, basically, I think for my next fantasy scenario, I might go somewhere completely different. Um, I might actually do something desert-based. I'm thinking Egypt sort of based. I have been tinkering with that idea for a little bit, so I think that's Bitter Frost. The next one might be Bitter, bitter Sun, but I would say that fantasy is as open-ended as you want it to be. Uh, that's one of the great things about it. 
All right, bitter son, you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> Big exclusive, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for your historical scenarios, how much research do you do and how do you go about it? Well, oddly enough, I used to really scorn uh, Wikipedia and used to say, ha, it's only people who don't have any real research who use that. Now, oddly enough, I find myself on Wikipedia quite a lot. I do obviously have quite a lot of historical books at hand. I have got quite a hefty library. Obviously, there's no better source than your fellow Civ fans as well, because when you put up a beta test on, on the site, you will... I think it was Dictator 4 had masses of help from people that are really useful. There's a lot of really knowledgeable guys on Apolliton, Civ 2. They really know the stuff. And uh, they are... Amongst them, they've got the whole World War Two covered from Allied or Axis side. So they're a real great source of reference. Uh, all you have to do is ask these guys, and they will give you orders of battle. They'll give you maps... Uh, it's, it is good. That is that is a strength of a community, really. I would say that you've got guys of all. They all have different areas of knowledge. Okay, I'll use this opportunity now to plug the history forum mm. on a Polton. <laughs> <laughs> Part of off topic. Oh yeah, yeah. I forgot that little uh, the history forum. I forgot all about that aspect. I do apologize. <laughs> well, you're forgiven this time. <laughs> I'll, I'll not slip up. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so what do you think makes the Civ 2 scenario a good scenario? You mean what what constitutes a good scenario? Yeah. I would say, I mean, obviously, since very... I recently went on Amazon, I got Conflicts and Civilization again, just for sheer nostalgia, and also the fact I couldn't find my original disc, but I, I bought it secondhand. Mm. Uh, and I noticed that back then, the scenarios... It's amazing how scenarios have evolved. There's not any part of Civ 2 now that hasn't been modded. Back then, you got a units file, you got a readme, and you got a rules file, and that was a scenario. I mean, these these guys were geni- yeah. some of these guys are geniuses. This is where the, the very first Civ Two guys kind of cut their teeth and started making the, the big strides. But I would say what makes a good scenario, looking at that historical scenarios and looking at the kind of things that are done now, the first step is to make sure there's a progression of technology that gives you the illusion that there's more than there actually is. One scenario is a uh, imperialism done by exile or Phoenix Benton. His scenario had this amazing illusion that you're playing it forever. It was like playing a original Civ 2 game. The way he had made the technologies seem to go on and on, and there was never any end. And that was one of Civ 2's big strengths, the fact that it's non-linear. It doesn't have to end. A good scenario will use that aspect of good planning to give you more than actually is in it to make you feel. I'd say also to make sure that there's nothing that trips up the actual scenario from turn one. There's nothing worse than the as they call it, the first turn money bug, where you conquer a city and you wipe out the AI's uh, treasury with one hit. Mm. That is because there's a reason to that happens and a reason to avoid it. It's a, I would say also no cities uh, should be set up to be starving or super abundant in food. Uh, basically, just a, a proper checklist of checking the typical Civ 2 problems. And graphics are not an issue either. This is one thing... I would like to take opportunity to say people would probably think that good graphics make a good scenario. Not always the case. I mean, sometimes basic graphics, like the old scenarios I mentioned earlier, they had very basic graphics, but the gameplay was stellar. That was the main point. But I would say that there's no magic magic formula for a good scenario. Just good good housekeeping when it comes to testing before you do the initial release. Make sure everything works. I would say the best thing it makes a scenario is that it's fun and that it represents what it's meant to represent and is true to itself. It's true to what it sets out to do. That's probably the best acme of what makes a good scenario. So uh, what are some of the best Civ 2 scenarios to date that everyone should try? Oh, I don't know if you're be allowed to make this. Uh, oh, it does have to be comprehensive. Yeah, I don't want to omit anyone. I mean, obviously there's tons of brilliant scenarios. I would say there is certain scenarios that stand out as classics in the Guineer. If we want to go way back, there's Up the Deadly Boots by Harlan. There's, I mean, I could give you a checklist. The ones that everybody should play, I would say, is obviously any of Nemo's Red Front, mm. 2,194 Days of War. Quite a mouthful. His World War, his World War II global scenario, uh, Second Front. For other types of scenarios, I would say uh, Imperialism by Exile, of course. Uh, Mongols by Harlan as well. I'm trying to think of a, a rounded list here because, I mean, I think the fan of Civ 2 should just try everything. If it's something he's not seen before, try it out. But I would say there's so many old classics. Ah, let me think. Bibro's uh, Crossing Crescent. 
and also his Imperium. Uh, those two are real classics. That was so ahead of their time. There was the Seeds of Greatness as well. Now, I can't remember the author, which is rather terrible of me. I'm a bit of a loss to remember anymore, but I would say, yeah, uh, anything by Nemo, anything by Harlan, anything by uh, Phoenix Benton, I would say any of the scenarios from 2000 onwards are all bound to be classics because there was a certain quality control applied by fans after that time where once Nemo had made his scenarios, that set the benchmark because they said, right, there has to be this and there has to be that. I would just say anything that interests you. But I would say those ones I mentioned are probably quite essential for your collection. So you mentioned uh, Bitter Sun, but you're not going to tell us anything more about it, and it's more of an upcoming project anyway. So what is your latest project, and what can you tell us about that? It'll come as no surprise. I've kind of let hints out on a polyton anyway. It's going to be a a redux, as it were, of uh, the Dictator series. And people might say, oh, grown... Not another World War II scenario, but this one is slightly different in that I've tried to add a few new concepts to this one. Obviously a complete graphical overhaul as well. Basically same map, but changed. Uh, I now have an idea of mustering armies instead of actually building everything. You can build your basic garrison and tank units, but this time, if you want the special elites like uh, US Airborne Commandos, or Russian guards, you really have to research a special a special technology that's given, then taken away, so you can research it again. Uh, and this way, it will give the elite units a bit more. It gives them a bit more value. I always enjoyed an Age of Crusade scenario that gave you these hero units. Same with Harlan's Mongols unit. The units from that you had a Genghis Khan unit that you you end up having this one unit that you don't want to lose because he's so valuable. He's the only guy who can really punch into cities. And I, I really love that aspect in Civ 2, you've got a, a kind of precious unit you don't want to lose, so my new scenario is going to be a lot of emphasis on that, where you will build these special units, some of them once-only units, and you'll go to big lengths to try and stop them getting taken out, and they will form spearheads of your attacks, etc. Beyond Dictator, uh, I mentioned my kind of space scenario, but I, I I could give you a little bit of information about the Bitter Sun if you do want to know about it. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. <laughs> sure, sure. Okay, well, this time it will be set in a kind of desert surrounding, as I mentioned earlier. The human players will have a choice between, again, two or maybe three playable civs, and the rest will be just evil attackers. And basically you'll have a choice between kind of undead Babylonian guys, I'm calling this because I don't actually have a name for these races yet, fully fleshed out, and there will be a race of cat dudes who will be filling the Egyptian kind of slots, and there will be also mechanical sort of guys who fill the sort of nomadic type warriors, and also there's kind of bad guys in Bitter Frost called the Ancients who are the kind of stock they meant to be just a one-off in the first version, but they've just been in every version since. So this time they're going to be invading via the desert. Uh, they're going to be featuring new units and new... They're going to be zooming about in tanks and stuff. So that could be interesting. Try fighting a tank off with a sword. Uh, that's going to be the, one of the big challenges in it. So it should be a lot of fun. It's completely different. It gives, the thing I love about doing new scenarios is it gives a lot of opportunities to do new visuals and new graphics. So this time there'll be lots of desert themes, lots of cool new terrain to work on, uh, new icons. The real, the real buzz for me is creating new content. It's always, I think that is one of the things that's kept the community going is everybody creating new units and new graphics and basically just, just trying to push the boundaries more and more every, every year. Well, you know, now if a phalanx can beat a battleship, then I think a swordsman can be the tank. <laughs> yeah, the, as the old. That's that rule still stands in Civ too. Um, I've not been able to find a website that, is, that lists more than one or two of your scenarios. Um, I can sort of find them by searching on Peloton's uh, forum history, but that's a bit of a pain. Mm-hmm. Is there any one place where we can find all of your work? Well, because of websites coming and going, websites moving on and deleting their databases. I, ha- I have been uh, intending to basically find somewhere to kind of settle, as it were, and get everything up there. There is one place, is a uh, Scenario League's own wiki page, which has got uploading facilities. Now, last time I checked, they were rebuilding uh, some of the facilities, and I couldn't actually create new pages. But one of my definite to-dos is to basically get everything up on the Scenario League wiki page and make that a repository for everything. Come 2007, keep your eyes on the Scenario League wiki page. That is where I'm going to lay down the old uh, 
lay down my hat and basically uh, get everything up there. Because uh, it would be nice just to have all the old stuff up as well. Because a lot of people ask me, where's Soviet steel? Where's uh, K- Kaiser and all these other scenarios I've done a few years ago? And yeah, they're all yeah. on the hard drive. I really just need somewhere to put them. Oh, that's good to know. Mm-hmm. I'll have to keep an yeah. eye on that. And I think Water Planet, so he could ask that last question, so he could say something on a bolt and was a pain. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> <laughs> you planned that all along. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Feeling guilty? Uh- <laughs> <laughs> If you have any questions for us, you can... Which brings us towards the end of this podcast. Polycast? Podcast? <laughs> Although I do think we need to have mention of, uh, of Dan Q's avatar. I think it's quite an important issue. Uh, apparently some people think it's more important than others. Would you like me to go back to the uh, Bolt and 8th birthday logo avatar I have? Had? I'm actually going to slightly... Um, what's the word? Uh, controversial here. I actually quite like the 8th birthday logo. I must be the only person who did. <laughs> I'm sorry. You seem to have <laughs> lost control. Goodbye, Will. <laughs> oh, well. Is Marcus ever going to make another one, or is it just going to be you guys doing it from now on? I have no graphics ability. I, I, I don't Neither do I. Idea. There was a common misconception, but I did the fifth birthday logo, and that's not true. That was Dark Cloud. Oh. I like all of the logos, actually, except the eighth one. With my avatar. I think we can all agree is fine the way it is. What'd I say? Oh, I said it too fast. I'm sorry. You just have to agree uh, with me. Key? <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite worried about what's winning in this Hick Groves crap catchphrase. It's, I was actually quite, quite worried. Some of, the, some of the suggestions were reasonable, but um, this has drove on long enough is not the most intelligent one I've seen so far. <laughs> <laughs> I actually like Drove the Destroyer drove myself. <laughs> Well, even without the sauce, just Drogue the Destroyer, that would be a, a nice one if you ask me, but... Well, if you had Drogue the Destroyer, that, that kind of uh, would go with your uh, playing style, wouldn't it? You said you're evil. Uh, I am evil, but I, I, I'm, I'm a builder type, but I build and build and build, and then sort of... I wait till someone's in a war with someone else and then stab them in the back. I just don't like trying all out wars. So yeah, I'm, I'm evil, but not really a destroyer. Oh... Oh, so dro- uh, Drogue the Backstabber is not on the poll either? No. Oh, no. oh too bad. <laughs> and so that brings us to the end. I have been Drogue, and I am Will Bramley, only a guest host today, so you will probably not hear from me for quite a while. Um, and with me there is... Uh, Wouter, known on the forums as Locutus. Daniel Quick, known as Dan Q on the forums. This is our last regular Polycast episode for the year, but don't you worry, we have a holiday treat for you in just a couple of weeks' time. Thank you for uh, joining us, Will. Cheers for having me. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Thanks for listening. And goodbye, everyone. Record date December 9th, 2006. Edited by Daniel Thank You Quick. Soundtrack courtesy Civilization 4 and the Warlords Expansion Pack. Copyright 2006, a Bolton Civilization site at a Bolton.net.